Just starting? OK. Uh, there was a good group there who did not raise their hands. Sorry? <laughs> You're just late to raise a hand. OK. Uh, any agile coaches here? OK, a few. OK. How many people who are not agile coaches here? Yay. OK, more. <laughs> Good. So uh, all the people who raised uh, your hands are the people I am uh, doing this for, uh, talking about my experience of how I used to be just an agile practitioner, uh, but circumstances led me to taking up the agile coaching role. Uh, in fact, it's probably something that you guys will run into pretty soon. I'm mean, sure some of you are um, starting off just on your agile journey. But soon you'll see that, oh, it works. Let's just try it out some more. Uh, you start with one team. And then you uh, see, oh, it's working for us. Some other teams in our organization want to try it out as well. Now what do we do? Uh, one approach could be you get some external coaches and spread them across multiple teams. But it's a good chance that that model will not scale. I mean, how many external coaches will you get? How many can you afford? Uh, plus it will not sustain, right? Soon, soon you'll have to look at practitioners taking on the role of agile coaches. Maybe not per permanently, uh, maybe uh, on a rotation basis. Uh, I, I definitely hope to be an agile coach on a rotation basis. I would like to go back to a delivery project and be a practitioner as well. Um, so I think it's almost time we can start. So I've already set the premise here. So from an individual perspective, there are reasons that you would like to try coaching uh, away from just a practitioner, being just a practitioner on an agile uh, team. Uh, maybe I'll share some of my motivations uh, soon. Uh, and from an organization perspective, this is again a topic that you have to look at, um, just from a scaling perspective, scaling agile coaching in your organization. So there's an alternate slide, title slide, which is this one, about how I got to be from that person to that person. And what's the difference between the two pictures? Anyone can guess? <laughs> okay, I became black and white. I became very unidimensional, monotonous. Uh, when do you think this picture was taken? Okay, so uh, maybe maybe this was like six, seven years back. So good guess. Uh, almost a fresher there. Uh, starting off on my agile journey as a practitioner. Uh, when was that taken? Yesterday? <laughs> okay, a few months back. Uh, I was hoping for a different answer where people will not be able to tell. Because some people do say I still look very young. Uh, so I was, I was hoping you would say, oh, they are just taken very close by. <laughs> but yes, uh, I did become black and white. Uh, or this uh, title should, could be uh, not from practitioner to coach, but who stole Aman's smile? Yeah? <laughs> OK. Uh, okay. But uh, the question is what to expect. I, I'm just joking here. Uh, it's, it's not about who stole my, uh, stole my smile. Uh, it is about my uh, stories, not user stories, but personal stories about my first Agile coaching gig, uh, which I did a couple of years back, and my personal experiences using some coaching techniques that I discovered. Um, I'll be sharing a few of that. It's again a short presentation, just 20 minutes. Um, so there's more to say. Uh, do visit these links uh, to get more details. Uh, Every experience report in this uh, Agile conference has a backing document. Uh, I have a five-page document which is uploaded to the Agile India website. Uh, I'd suggest you read that. So uh, talking about my story, right? So once upon a time, I was a happy developer. I was a happy Agile developer. These are some of the things I used to do, right? Uh, typical stuff as a developer, uh, things that you make you happy in an Agile team. TDD, refactoring, pair programming, stand-ups, uh, something that didn't make us happy, velocity charts, uh, story points, estimations, uh, and lots and lots of coffee. Who here likes coffee? Good. I'm, I'm a big coffee addict. Some, some of you know that already. And I did this for many years, right? Year after year, project after project. Uh, thankfully, mostly successful deliveries, some unsuccessful. Uh, after a point, I was almost about to roll off a project, and I thought I'll take a break. I'll go to the beach. 
Uh, at ThoughtWorks, uh, we call uh, waiting for a project being on the beach. Some people call it bench, right? Uh, but I was literally thinking of going to a beach. Sadly, uh, who, who's the villain in such a situation? The boss, or, or uh, in particular, the staffing, staffing manager, right? And that staffing manager comes over and tells me, uh, dude, uh, so we have an agile enablement gig coming up. And we need you, starting Monday, to play the role of a coach. <laughs> and I was like, OK, what does that involve, right? I, I've never uh, thought of coaching before. Uh, and he's like, don't worry, don't worry. You've been this uh, really great agile practitioner for so all these years in our company, right? We have full confidence that you will be able to uh, just help other teams do the same thing that you do. I'm like, sure, uh, sounds, sounds reasonable. I mean, I've worked with uh, new hires in my company, uh, juniors as well as uh, laterals. Um, so maybe I'll give this a shot. And anyways, doing the same thing again and again, while it's fun, uh, uh, it's, it's nice to take a break from delivery as well. It does become repetitive after time. I mean, how many standups do you want to attend in your lifetime, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I signed up for it uh, very happily. Uh, and I was uh, all enthusiastic of playing coach for the first time, right? And so what did I do as a coach uh, in this team that I joined? <laughs> I, did, I did TDD, I did pair programming, I did stand-ups, I helped people with velocity charts, helped them with estimation, and drank a lot and a lot of coffee, more than I was drinking before. Uh, the only difference being uh, I, was, I was working with teams who were not perhaps as experienced as my colleagues that I had been working with, but that's OK. Uh, it's still the same stuff I was doing. Um, so what, did you, what do you think that led me to confusion? What am I, what am I doing with the team, right? Uh, am I doing the coach role right? Is this what a coach is supposed to do? This, do the same thing that an agile developer does? Uh, just help uh, others explain to them, teach them how to do it? Uh, I had a lot of questions. Um, sadly, I was not able to get answers to those. And when questions don't lead to answers, they lead to frustrations, yes? And I went through these moments where I was frustrated, um, partly with myself and partly uh, with the inability of certain people to get me support. Because I would ask for support, I would ask for answers, no one would give me answers, right? And uh, frustration after a point, sorry, frustration after a point led to a boredom. Because sure, I was doing what I knew, which was being a good agile developer with this team uh, and helping them on. Uh, but I was starting to get bored. I, I still felt that there's probably more to this coach role, right? Uh, thankfully, thankfully I, I said, this is, this is enough. Uh, let's figure this out. And I reached, to, reached out to more colleagues of mine. I used my network, people who had done coaching before. And they were starting to give me answers. And then finally, that started becoming uh, so it started becoming uh, interesting. Um, so they would, they would answer my queries, they would get suggestions, they would get advice, the best things, they would point me to articles or books to read. Um, uh, one, one of the resources was the uh, Agile Coaching Institute uh, that a colleague of mine uh, mentioned uh, uh, late, uh, later um, in my transition. But you know what helped the most was just looking around me. Sure, I was being a good agile developer with these people who, who had not experienced agile before. But those people themselves were enough to tell me what a coach role is about. Because they were excited about a few things that I had introduced to them. Uh, they would have a lot of questions. And with my encouragement, they were able to try things on their own. So there was progress that the team started making. And they would give a lot of that credit to me. That's when I ha hit a nirvana point. And I started. Realizing at least one takeaway, which was earlier, my focus was uh, in this priority order. First, software, writing good software, meeting your uh, um, uh, business value for your clients, right? Uh, releasing good software out, doing TDD, good code base. So software was primary for me. Second was team, working well in a collaborative environment with, with, with the team, right? Uh, are you being efficient as a team? And finally, individuals, maybe the few people that I would mentor here and there, uh, just as part of my day-to-day -day job. Uh, but I soon realized that a coach has to reverse that priority order. Focus on the individuals around you. Help them improve. Help them on their journey. Help them discover their strengths. 
that will kind of sort out the team issue on its own. But again, get the team to gel together. And you know what? That will do something magical to your software. A lot of good quality stuff will come out uh, automatically, almost automatically. Today, I have this uh, definition of coaching. It's always evolving. But this is my definition of coaching. It's about getting the most out of individuals and teams by raising their awareness levels about the current environment, the environment outside theirs, and most important of all, their own potential. Because it's not like the people I was working with were not smart, right? It's not like they, they were dumb. It's just about are they realizing what status quo they are in, right? Are they challenging it? Do they have enough exposure to the uh, practices happening outside in the industry, outside their team, in another team, within the organization, outside the organization? Are they attending con conferences like these, right? Just helping them with the, that exposure. And then figuring out their strengths and making sure that they use that to their uh, best ability. But you need a model, you need a structure. This is a simplified coaching model that helped me on that first gig and in a lot of subsequent gigs. It's basically where you spend some initial time uh, in an assessment period trying to gauge, be sure not to give out advice right at the start. This is about understanding their context. Then you figure out how you want to go about active coaching. And finally, you want to leave the team in a sustenance level, where you become redundant, you can walk away, you create a space for the team members to step up on their own. Uh, and these will have some coaching techniques, which I tried. I'll share some of those here. During assessment, uh, it's basically a two to three period. Maybe it could go on till a week. A good way to start is to interview the team members of your team. If it's a large team, then maybe you can't cover everyone, but get a good representative sample. Try to understand uh, what their background is, what role do they play, what processes do they follow, and most importantly, what challenges do they face. Yes. All that information that you gather, you can start mapping visually as a process. That will lead you to a visual process map. I use stickies to get a process map out. And the good thing about that is that you can get more team members in and validate that process, your understanding of the process. And they can help fill some of the gaps. And initially, you'll want to capture some numbers, some metrics. It's important how you uh, use those numbers later on. But remember, those numbers are just FYI for now. They may not actually lead to a lot of action. Active coaching is actually about pairing with actual team members on actual project work. I keep repeating the word actual because it has to be real. You have to be there for, for them day to day on, and help them perform their role day to day. Whether it be QAs uh, with identifying test scenarios or developers doing TDD uh, or product owners trying to prioritize and slice uh, stories. In addition to that, you will need to focus on facilitation. And by facilitation, it's, it's a very broad word. You have to be careful of how you interpret it. It's not just facilitating a discussion or a huddle. It's, it's, it's that, but it's also about facilitation of thought processes of individual team members and collective uh, group. Um, and it's facilitation in terms of unblocking people, empowering them uh, to make changes. Measuring progress, because hopefully active coaching is leading to improvements, but you, make to, you need to make sure that it's in the right direction. And very, very important is focusing on self-learning for the team members. You need to realize that you won't be there all the time to teach them stuff. You're not expected to. You need to teach them how to learn. And this self-learning hopefully will lead to self-discovery, where not only they, do they learn how to learn, but they start looking inward and figure out what strengths they have at an individual level, how those strengths can fit into a bigger picture in an agile team or an agile project, and maybe in the organization. And they play to their strengths. And sustenance is the period where you realize that uh, your engagement with the team is probably going to end soon. You're going to move on. That's a good time to work on a benefits report for your stakeholders so that they, they uh, realize what benefits they got from the coaching. And more importantly, any recommendations for next steps so that they can continue the journey without you. Quickly taking a look at some examples. Is this clear? Is the picture clear? No? Thank goodness. Because <laughs> probably client sensitive information. So I've deliberately made that a little hazy. Uh, but you can see the stickies I mentioned, right? Uh, 
So you just uh, use a whiteboard and you stick, stick stuff up. Each sticky represents a step in a larger process. In this example, uh, people start off writing epics. They're like really, really high level uh, requirements, for lack of a better word. Uh, those epics are then broken down somewhere here into features. The features are then broken down into stories. At some point, the features are also estimated by a few people. And then the stories are also estimated by a few people. The two levels of estimates happening. Uh, those people we are annotating here, right? And then the stories go through the iteration. Uh, there's a regression in the end. There's a deployment. Uh, there's a go/no-go -no -go decision taken, uh, and then there are uh, there's customer support. So that that's one example of a process uh, that was being followed at an, at an organization. This was based out of the information I got from interviews. I got uh, the PM, the technical lead, and the product owner into that room, had them validate this. Uh, they are the ones who helped me with the annotation, got some roles against the processes, who's doing what, even got some names in there, actual names of individuals who I could reach out to and get more details. And uh, they helped me identify gaps. So there were some stickies I had missed, but they called out, hey, this step is missing. So they can help complete the picture for you. And then you let those guys out, and you get some more people from on the ground, the lowly developers, the lowly testers, and let them see what part of the picture uh, they, they recognize. Uh, by the way, I was just kidding. Huh? I, I was being a little sarcastic with the lowly developer thing. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting. Where when you get a developer in, he'd probably be very good with the details here, and they'll probably not even know what's happening up there. So this exercise actually helped team members. It f helped facilitate team members' thought process about the entire flow. I would ask a question, how does what you uh, go live with feed back into the entire process? And then they wouldn't know, right? That there's a customer support thing happening. There's feedback from the customers. Uh, how the product managers work on that with the help of product owners, and so on and so forth. A very useful exercise to do with the team. Uh, talk about collecting numbers. Um, if your team had already started Agile, if, like some of you here, uh, you probably have some tools like Jira or Mingle in place or Jenkins Go um, for product management or CI. Uh, if yes, then these numbers are easy to get. If it's a totally fresh team who's not done Agile before, you don't have any tools in place, there'll be some manual work involved for you to get numbers like these. So that's velocity, coverage, and uh, defect counts. Talking about Active coaching, facilitation, right? Uh, it's not very clear. But on the top left, this is an exercise I did with a team uh, recently. Uh, it's called a mind mapping technique. Right? Um, you've got a group of people in, into the room. Now you want to brainstorm around how do you want to deal with the story within the sprint? What is the life cycle of the story? But a good starting point was to just brainstorm what is the story? What does the team feel that a story is? I had no role in coming up with the items here. It was a team who was talking out. We started with that bubble. And then people started fleshing out, oh, a story is an idea. It's a requirement. It's a feature. Uh, why do we do it? Who's involved? What is the objective of the story? Uh, what kind of activities need to happen in the story? And then that led to even further uh, fruitful discussion. On the right, that was a closed meeting with, uh, again, the product, product manager, uh, the project manager, uh, and the technical lead about their roles and responsibilities, clarity about their roles and responsibility. I used a Venn diagram there to get multiple perspectives of a role and responsibility. The, the Venn diagram had uh, sets for uh, environments, um, skill set, and uh, interpersonal uh, relationship. And this, of course, is, is a typical uh, uh, well done uh, retrospective. Uh, it's a variation of uh, speedboat exercise or anchors and engines that you must have seen. Uh, there's, there's a vehicle there stuck in mud. The mud is your uh, anchor. The fuel is your engine. Uh, Self-learning. I mentioned self-learning. I found the Princeton model very useful. Uh, this is what Princeton University uses. Uh, they say that 70% of learning happens by doing actual problem solving. That's what I've been mentioning. My active coaching was mostly about solving real problems on their actual project. Uh, but 20% of the learning happens through uh, examples. That's where knowledge sharing sessions come in, uh, workshops maybe. Um, you can see a 
Kanban uh, board that I had set up with the team, where the team would put up stickies of topics they wanted to talk about, learn about, discuss. And as and when we had a weekly or bi-weekly knowledge sharing session, we would move it to done. Um, and then 10% is a reading, reading on your own. Uh, so I typically start up an email thread or a wiki page where we would collectively get uh, links that we should be reading, links to blogs, articles, stuff like that. It's a big coincidence that a lot of the links are <laughs> from Martin Fowler's uh, website. Uh, if he's in the room, a big thanks to him for uh, writing a lot of good stuff out there and hosting other people's articles as well. Measuring progress. So quick quiz for you guys. So those are the numbers before and after coaching, a certain period of coaching. Given the metric of code coverage, which team is making more progress? So raise your hand if you think it's team B. OK. So everyone thinks it's team A. Is that right? OK, that's because 25 is greater than 10%, right? 25% is greater than 20, uh, 10%. Another question. So given the metric of defect count, that's before and after, which team did better? Hands if you think it's A. Okay, no one? So everyone's thinking it's B? Both? Well, better, better. So it has to be a comparison, right? Uh, all things same. All things, yes. Uh, given, given all things the same, then, then sure. Uh, it looks like B had lesser defects, so maybe uh, they're making better progress. Given this, which team made more progress? B. There are a few A's, uh, but a little more of B's. And maybe the answer is yes. Because sure, uh, team A had all their focus on increasing code coverage. But why do you do code coverage? That number is not really important. The hope is that code coverage will lead to better quality. And another reflection of better quality is the number of defects that you have, right? So maybe the code coverage wasn't important. Maybe the kind of unit tests they were writing were not really good unit tests. They just helped increase coverage. They didn't add value that a unit test should be adding. Uh, so maybe B was better. A twist in the story. Um, so if this was taken in the iteration or sprint where two out of the three QAs were on vacation for team B. For team B, two out of three QAs were on vacation. So maybe that's why they have lesser defects. They could have more defects, but no one discovered them. So that's just a game that numbers will play. So as a coach, you have to be very, very careful with metrics. Just be very, very careful because they are very easy to misinterpret. Metrics are an indicator of progress. They do not guarantee that progress is happening. So always use subjectivity and context. Uh, quickly talking about sustenance. So again, some exercises uh, that I like to do. This is called circle of competence. I learned about it uh, from a colleague. You have the team uh, in the room. You give everyone an individual sheet of paper. They draw a stick figure for themselves. They put a circle around it. They list down points which they feel they are comfortable or they know well within the circle. And outside the circle, they put points that they want to learn or improve upon. So that's a lot of introspection that's happening. And then they go around and look for people who, who already know the things that they want to learn. And you get people to connect with each other. That's just an art exercise where you just have people draw themselves uh, as a way of introducing them without using words. So that's some crazy person <laughs> who probably loves beaches and uh, it's funny on the outside, a little somber on the inside. I have no clue. Uh, and of course, there are uh, better known tools for self-discovery like Strengths Finder and MindTime. People have actually found it useful. I found it useful, so I do recommend it. Uh, benefits reporting. So it's, Good to take a survey from the team. So instead of you reporting the benefits of what you perceive, let the team talk about what, what they liked from the coaching period, what they've learned. Put a few pictures from the team area, which shows that they are uh, getting to that sustenance level. They are doing things on their own, a, a nice, well-maintained story, storyboard, story wall, uh, or new uh, visual indicators that they are putting. Uh, for example, a team came up with this idea for managing their time boxing of stand-up. Some techniques, there were some techniques that I discovered with the help of others or, or just came up on my own. Um, but there's more out there. The question is, are you ready for it? Are you ready for this role? As an individual, I feel you need a lot of patience and you need empathy. 
and it's difficult. You have to grow that. So while you're coaching others, remember that you yourself are getting coached in some of these attributes. It's, it's a, a learning uh, journey for you as well. Uh, you need to focus a lot on facilitation skills. And you do need experience and mentoring skills as well to help teams in difficult spots. As an organization, you'll need practitioners with coaching aptitude. Not every practitioner may make a good coach. You need coaches to coach the coach. Of course, you need a support structure for coaching. For example, just a community of coaches, they're sharing learnings across each other, a knowledge repository where they put up stuff. But most important of all, empowering the coaches to try experiments with the team, right? Uh, give, give them that, that, that empowerment. And hopefully, if you do these things, and then maybe more, someday you guys will make the transition from practitioner to coach. And my best wishes to you guys. It always ha ha helps to have a friend and, uh, during that journey. Feel free to think of me as that friend. And there are others out there you can reach out to. Uh, so be in touch. Uh, thanks for your time here. I did exceed time, so uh, catch me offline if you have any questions. Thank you, guys.